Okay, we're going to begin. Last time we started talking about two kinds of maximums and minimums, we talked about the absolute max and min. Um, talk about absolute max min. This was the highest. Specifically state the domain or interval, you want to find the biggest or the smallest values on the entire domain, right? And we talked spoke about local max and min. These are the highest, lowest values in a small local region. Right, so an example would be something like We have a function like that. This guy here would be an absolute max. Right? And it's also a local max, but you more want to think of it as an absolute max. Well this guy here would be a local max. And in particular, it's not the absolute max, because if you're looking on everything globally, he's not the biggest guy in general. However, in his small neighborhood, he's the biggest guy. And that's the difference between a local max versus an absolute max. Uh, we knew how to find the absolute max last time. And there will be a problem like this on the next test and on the final, guaranteed. Um, so it's going to be either, it's going to be one part of the problem in part two. Right, so there's going to be a problem where part A is like find an absolute maximum in and then part B is something else. But finding absolute maximums and minimums. Is with a critical part? Uh, we use, I'm going to remind you what we do. We use the closed interval method. Because in this class, I'm always going to ask you about the absolute maximum min on a closed interval. So I will specifically say, find the absolute maximum min on this interval. It's always going to be that. And then you use the closed interval method. Right? So method one was to find the critical points, evaluate them. Evaluate those that occur in the interval. Plug in the endpoints. Plug in A into F, plug in B into F, right? This is for F of X on the interval A, B. Alright, so I find the critical points that's in that interval, which means you find the derivative, you set it equal to zero undefined, solve for those X values, then plug them into the original, as long as it's possible. Evaluate the original function at the endpoints. That is, find f of a and f of b. And then third, you compare. Right? Compare all the y values you found in the previous two steps. And the largest in the above steps is your absolute max. And the smallest in the above steps is the absolute min. And that's what we did last time. We did an example of that that you can review. Now we're actually going to move on to finding local maximums and minimums. If I wanted to find this guy and not necessarily that guy, how would I actually go about it? That's what we're going to talk about now.
We're going to have two main methods here. One is called the first derivative test. is in fact the recommended method. Kind of because in a problem where you need to do this, you're going to have to do this test anyway, so you might as well just use it for two purposes instead of one. Um, because you'll need this first third of the test to tell you other things, like where the function is increasing or decreasing. So you'll be doing it anyway, so you can also use that same thing to find the maximum in, and I'll show you how. The, another method is called the second third of the test which takes an extra step. You have to find the second derivative and then you're going to evaluate it and you'll use the two cases, derivative doesn't exist. In this case, derivative exists and it's equal to zero. Right? Similar. Um, so we want to cover all those cases. Right? So that's, first we find the critical points and then step two. Plot these on a number line. And test the unfamiliar notion. It's the similar to how you would do something when you're like solving an inequality. It's the same kind of process. Once you do that and you test the intervals, um, Basically, all you're looking for, you don't really care about the value, you care about the signs. You want to know where the derivative is positive versus negative. Because positive is going to be increasing, negative is going to be decreasing. And in general here, the domains will stretch to um, infinity on the right and negative infinity on the left. And so you wouldn't really care about process parts like these. So the third, step three, is going to classify. based on what the test says, right? So if here you have a critical point, this is what has to happen to know that it's a local maximum. You have to be, first you test the derivative and it's positive here, which means their function is increasing. You test it on the right side and it's negative, which means their function is decreasing, and the function is continuous at this point. Once those three conditions are fulfilled, this means you have a local maximum. Right? So you're increasing on the left, you're decreasing on the right, and you exist at that point. Right? That gives you a local maximum. Um, if the function doesn't exist at this point, like you have an asymptote or a hole, you're not anything. Right? And, uh, like, so again, the function has to be continuous at your critical point. Now, if 
you're decreasing on the left side, but you're increasing on the right side, and you're continuous at that point, that gives you a local min. Otherwise, you have neither of these. So this is what a local max will look like. This is what a local min will look like. If it doesn't look like this, it's not either of those. It's something else. So let's do some examples. Using the first derivative test, then we'll show you a few of the second derivative tests, not many, because I don't think it's worth going there most of the time especially in this class. We're going to do those guys, and that will end the section. So remember, here we're using the first derivative test. I'll show you about the second derivative test uh, later. But right now, we're focusing on the first derivative test. It's something you're going to have to know how to do anyway um, for the curve sketching section. Um, so let's start with the first function, y equals x. What do you think that the local maximums and minimums are here? Shouldn't have any, right? If you look at the graph, it's just like that. There is no local max or min. So we expect to see the answer to be none. Well, let's see what we get. So step one, what we're going to do is we're going to find the critical points. Right? So we're going to find the derivative. Y prime would be equal to one. So for critical points, we need y prime equals 0 or y prime undefined. So this would mean you need 1 equals 0 or 1 undefined. No solution. So there are no critical points. Which means on a number line, right? if I test it in the derivative, any random point I pick on this interval, and I plug it into the derivative, the answer is always 1. It's always positive, which means it's always increasing. In particular, it doesn't look like this, and it doesn't look like that. So it has none. That one was easy. This particular function has no local max or min. Go to B. Draw this function. Step one. Find the derivative. So two x. So to get critical points, two x equals zero or undefined. 2x is a polynomial though, so it's never undefined, but I can solve this equals 0. What would be the result? x equals 
0. So x equals 0 is what we call a critical point. Well, critical number, technically. But I might say critical point all the time, being sloppy. 2, what we're going to do is we're going to plot this on a number line. So I'm going to put the point 0 here. That's my critical point. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to test the intervals. Notice that this zero splits the interval into two parts. There's zero to infinity, and there's negative infinity to zero. What I'm going to do is plug in random numbers in each of these intervals. And plug in something easy. Right? So like I can plug in a one, and I can plug in a minus one. And what I'm plugging these into is the derivative. Right? So if I plug a minus one into the derivative, I get minus two. It's a negative number, which means decreasing. My function is moving down. If I plug in a 1 into this, I get 2. I don't particularly care about the value 2, but I care that it's positive, which means increasing. Now, 0, actually, the function is actually continuous at 0. It's a polynomial. Every point works, which means that point exists. I'm decreasing on the left, increasing on the right. Therefore, this is it's a minimum. Right? That's what a minimum looks like. Right? That 0 will be the lowest point in this region. This means we have a local minimum at x equals 0. There's nowhere where I'm increasing on the left and decreasing on the right, so I actually have no local max. And that's your answer. Which makes sense, again, because in this case, we actually know what the graph looks like. So there is a point that's lower than everyone in that particular region, but there's no point that's higher than everyone in the particular region. So that's an example where we don't even have a critical point. There is no critical point here, so there could be no max and min. In this case, we have one critical point, and it ends up being a minimum. Let's look at x cubed. Again, step one, we're going to find the derivative. So now I'm going to try to find the critical points. What that means is I'm going to set 3x squared equal to 0 or undefined. 3x squared is never undefined. It's a polynomial. But I can solve it equal to 0. The solution is x equals 0. OK. So that's my critical point. Now what I'm going to do, step 2, is put it on a number line. And I'm going to test it in the derivative. So I'm going to put 0 here. Again, plug in a random numbers something easy, and I'm going to plug those numbers into the derivative. That's what gives me increasing and decreasing. If I plug in a negative 1 in here, 0 is It's going to be positive because it's a square. So it's increasing. Plug in a positive 1 into here. It's still positive. It's going to be increasing. What does that say? No max or min. Right? Because to be a max, you have to do like this and then that. And to be a min, you have to do like this and then that. It doesn't do either of these. It's not a max or a min. So for maximum, it has to be positive and then negative. It has to be positive, then negative. And for minimum, negative and then positive. Negative, then positive. And, and we can tell again from this graph, we know that y equals x cubed looks like that. But by now, we should. Right? There's no point along that curve that's lower than everyone in a certain region or higher than everyone in a certain region. It just keeps going up. So in the first case, we didn't even have a critical point. In the second case, we had a critical point, ended up being a minimum. In the third case, we have a critical point, but it ends up being nothing. So you really need to do this test. There are many variations. But the number line is going to tell you everything you need to know. Another example. Now remember what that is. That's just x if your x is positive, minus x if your x is negative, which means y prime is going to be 1 when you're positive. It's going to be minus 1 when you're negative. At x equals 0, it does not exist. I proved that when we were just learning about the derivative with the limit definition. We showed that the limit from the left and the right didn't agree. Because the right-hand limit gives us a 1, the left-hand limit gives us a negative 1. They didn't connect. 
And so the derivative actually does not exist at 0, which means that's a critical point. Otherwise, the derivative is never 0. It's either 1 or negative 1. So 0 is the only guy I would test in the derivative. And again, I'm going to pause it one. So I plug in a positive one in the derivative. Because x is positive, it means I plug that into the top function, which is 1, which is positive. Plug in a negative one. Because x is negative, I use this part, this definition for the function. So that's minus 1, which is negative. Now, absolute value of 0 is 0, so I am continuous here. So what kind of point is this? It ends up being a local minimum. Because this says my x is negative 1. Mm -hmm. In other words, my x is less than 0. Oh. Therefore, I use this definition of the function. Okay. Over here, my x was positive 1, so my x was greater than or equal to 0. <coughs> so I use that definition of the function. It's mm -hmm. a piecewise function. So I'm, I'm doing a bunch of examples with familiar functions so you can see it at play. Here, we realize that we have a local min. Zero, but we have no local max, which is expected because we know that the absolute value looks like this V-shaped thing, where that's the minimum. Right? It's a sharp corner, so the derivative doesn't exist there, which makes it a critical point. And it happens to be the lowest guy in a certain region. So it's nice because we know these pictures, we can sort of tell, but sometimes the picture is not going to be so clear. And this will still guide us. More examples. We're going to do this so many times, you're going to be sick of it eventually. That's why I can move so fast. After like the seventh example, you're going to be like, oh, I get it. So I, again, we know what that function looks like. It looks like that. So I expect there to be one answer. There should be a minimum here. Well, let's see. So 1, I'm going to find the derivative. Right. 1 over 2 radical x. It's 1 half x to the minus a half. And our critical point, um, set, um, I set y prime equals 0 or undefined. This means. I need 1 over 2 radical x equals 0 or undefined. Now, this is never 0, so it has no solution, right? If you have a fraction where the numerator is never 0, the fraction is never 0. However, it can be undefined if I plug in x equals 0. So x equals 0 is in the domain, but the derivative does not exist there. That makes that a critical point. So here's a 0. And I'm going to plug that into the derivative. <coughs> now notice, the function doesn't even exist over here. So there's no need to test that interval. If I can plug in a random number over here. And notice that if I plug it into the derivative, I will get a positive answer. So it's increasing. So the thing starts at 0, and it increases away from 0. It makes this a minimum. Would that be absolute? It's actually an absolute minimum. But where it's also a local okay. answer, so it overlaps. What was the other one? Y equals one over x. So again, derivative. Let's get rid of this guy. No. <laughs> negative x to the minus 2, so 1 over x squared, negative. And so now I set minus 1 over x squared equals 0 for undefined. Notice that it's never equals 0 again because the numerator is never 0, but it is undefined at x equals 0. So 
that's my critical point. Plug in a number here, plug in a number here. Now, if I plug in a number here into this, what do I get? It's positive or negative? It's negative. It's going to decrease it. Plug in a 1. Still negative. Decrease it. So that guy's nothing. It's decreasing on both sides. In fact, more than that, it doesn't even exist at zero. So it's, it's nothing. So the one over x squared, though, that one's a little bit tricky. Not a little bit, when you start to. And so I'm going to find y prime. What's the derivative here? Negative 2x to the negative 3. So we have this guy. And so now set minus 2 over x cubed equals 0 or undefined. Again, never 0, but it's undefined when x equals 0 because I divide by 0 here. So critical point, again testing the point 0, plug in a 1, plug in a minus 1. Plug 1 into here, what do I get? I get a negative number, which means decrease. I plug minus 1 into here, what do I get? Positive. So it means increase. So what kind of point is this? It's not a max. You guys tell me. It's not continuous at 0. The original function is 1 over x squared. I cannot plug in 0 to that function. It's, it's nothing, right? So, yeah, I'm increasing here, I'm decreasing there, but I do not exist here. It's nothing. It's not there. Right? This is nothing. Original undefined at this point. Right? So you really have to be careful. Remember, 1 over x squared looks like this. Right? Yes, I'm increasing here, I'm decreasing there, but I never actually hit a point in the middle that's higher than everyone. Right? It doesn't exist at that point. So you really have to be careful. You really have to know that this pattern happens, but at the same time, there's no problem at that point. Right? So there are three things you have to check for when you're checking for a max or a min. Right? So for a max, you have to be increasing here, check that you're decreasing there, check that you're continuous at that point. If all that's fulfilled, it's a max. For a min, if you're decreasing here, increasing there, and continuous here, that's a min. If one of those guys mess up, or you're, in a, you're not in a case where one of the intervals has just become irrelevant, you, you don't have a max or min. So this, had, this one had no max or min. It doesn't have any absolute max or min either. Okay, last one, a little bit more interesting. Step one. Sure. I can factor further. 
So then I have three solutions. I have x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals negative 1. So now I have three critical points to test. And again, I'm going to test them in the first derivative. This is step two. I have to test 0, I have to test 1, and I have to test negative 1. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4 intervals to test. And all I'm going to do is plug in a random number into each, in each one of those intervals. So we're at minus 2, positive 2 here. 0.5. 0 0.5. 0 I plug in a half. Negative a half, I can plug in there. Now I'm going to plug them into the first derivative. Um, remember, you, you want to just care about the signs. You don't really care about the values. So um, it's best to plug it in the factor form. It'll be easier for you to recognize the signs, right? So I'm going to plug these numbers into this form, right? It's just a derivative, but I factored it, right? It's going to be easy to see in the sign. So for example, if I plug in a negative 2, what is the sign of 4x if x is minus 2? It's a negative. What is the sign of this if x is minus 2? It's again a negative. What sign of this is x is minus 2? It's also a negative. So I have a negative and a negative and a negative. And it's negative, decreasing. Do the same thing for minus a half, right? What is the sign of four x if x is negative a half? Negative. 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 Positive. 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 I have minus a half plus one. A half is smaller than one. So I have negative, negative, positive. 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 So overall, it's positive. It means increasing. Plug in a half. Positive. Positive. A half minus one, negative. negative, half plus one, positive. positive. So negative. here I have positive, negative, positive. So overall it's negative, and that means decreasing. Plug in the two. Positive, positive, positive. So this was a positive times a positive times a positive, which makes it overall a positive, which means increasing. So now I'm going to go through and I'm going to classify these critical points. Focus on the minus 1. What is it? I'm decreasing here. I'm increasing there. And the function is continuous here because the function is a polynomial. It's continuous everywhere, which means this guy is a minimum. What about 0? This is a maximum. I'm increasing here decreasing here, and the function is continuous at 0 because it's a polynomial, so it's a maximum. What about 1? Minimum. It's a minimum. I'm decreasing here, increasing there, and the function is continuous at 1 because it's a polynomial, therefore I'm a minimum. So in this particular function, I have two minimums and one maximum. Right? So I have two local minimums and one local max. So I have local minimum. This is it at minus 1 comma blah and 1 comma blah and I have a local max at 0 comma well it's going to be 0. If I plug in minus 1 into here what do I get? I get minus 1. If I plug in positive 1 I also get minus 1. And so by the way that could help us draw a naive sketch of this thing. We're going to learn to sketch in much greater detail than this, but right now I can, can draw a very naive one. I can plug in, I know that's 0, 0. That's a maximum. I know that minus 1 comma minus 1 is a minimum. And I know that 1 comma minus 1 is also a minimum. So here's one of the basic ways you can start to graph this thing. Well, I know that I'm decreasing here, right? So the function is decreasing until I hit minus 1, which is a minimum. So my function is coming down, boom, until it hits that. 
Now, between minus 1 and 0, I start increasing again. So I know I'm going to increase from this point to that point. Boom. Between 0 and 1, I'm now decreasing. So I now have to decrease from 0 to 1 to hit that point. Boom. Then from 1 to infinity, I'm increasing. So for the rest of the way, boom. So that is actually a W. Yes? How do you get the point 1, minute 1? How do you find coordinates on a graph? That one. Yeah. Plug it into the origin. Oh. If I want to find coordinates on a graph, you always plug into the origin. Okay. Right. So you plug the x value to the original. Yes. If I want to find coordinates on the graph to actually plot points on this graph, you always plug into the original. That's what the original does. Okay. And then when I zero, I plug in zero here, I got zero. So that y value was zero. And here's a sketch of the scrap. It's actually like a double. Um, also appreciate here, these guys here, they're kind of like vertices, right? In a more general sense than a problem. However, there is no general formula for vertices if you're not a problem, right? So one of the things about derivatives, just knowing about increasing and decreasing, I can actually find exactly the points where vertices will happen. Right? without a general formula for a vertex, which is it's a pretty good thing to be able to find. A lot of times you're going to want to find when you're bigger or smallest, right? If this function represents profit, you're going to know when you're making the most money versus the le least amount of money you can possibly make. That's going to be important. So that's an example of local maximums and minimums, how you'd actually find them. Don't worry about sketching too much for now. We are going to cover it. But actually, just this part, knowing this kind of test, is going to be very important. Any questions? Um, let's do a few examples of the second derivative test. Let me just show you how that would work. Like I said, in the vast majority of cases, you're going to have to do this analysis anyway, so I, I probably just do the first derivative test all the time. But if you're in a case where you don't have to actually care about increasing or decreasing, you can actually use the second derivative test. Does the second derivative test the concavity? Yes, the second derivative test is concavity. But you can generate, you can extrapolate from the concavity what kind of point it is. In fact, the, the idea the idea here is if you have something like a maximum, your concavity is concave down. Right? You notice that a local max tends to be a frowning face. Yeah. So a max is tend to happen where the second derivative is negative, right? While a minimum tends to happen where the second derivative is positive, yeah. concave up like a cup or down like a frown. So we're kind of using that idea to determine maximums and minimums, even though we're using a second derivative in a, in a strange way it, it works out. But your derivatives have to exist here. It's not something where you can have like a merge sheet like that and this will work out for you. It actually won't. Um, so let's actually, so step one, find critical points. Right? Find the first set equal to zero or undefined, find those x values. Step two. Find the second derivative. Step three. If f prime equals zero, f double prime, second derivative, equals zero at the critical point. So we don't look at the case where it's undefined. We, 
we won't be able to get this information from this particular test. All right? But if the derivative is zero, then we have one or two cases. Case one. If exists, sorry. If f double prime is greater than zero, then it means I'm concave up and I have a local, or at a local point, local win, right? Up like a cup, smiley face. Or case two, if this second derivative is negative, this means I have a local max. Let's actually do the example with this, this last function that we did here. So using the second derivative test, step one, find the derivative. minus 1 times x plus 1. We did this before. So I know that x equals 0, x equals 1, x equals negative 1. So step 2, I'm going to find the second derivative, which is? What's the second derivative? 12x squared minus 4. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug these guys in. Now x equals 0, my second derivative equals, plug in zero, it's equal to negative of four, which means it's negative, all right? So my second derivative is negative at x equals zero, which means maximum, all right? Which agrees with the previous test. Now if I plug in x equals minus one, my second derivative would be equal to 12 minus 4. It's going to be 8, which is greater than 0, which means this is a minimum. If I plug in x equals positive 1, my second derivative will again be 8, which is greater than 0, so I get another minimum. All right, so I get two minimums and a maximum with the second derivative test. So notice here, I don't really get any information of where I'm increasing or decreasing, although I can kind of extrapolate it from the fact that I know that's a maximum. So I don't really know what the intervals are doing, but I can <coughs> actually just cut to the chase and know where my max and mins are. So you're just plugging in? Yeah, I, I literally just plug in x values, the critical one. seem less tiresome, but remember, in general, you'd have to do the first test anyway, so most of the time you do the first derivative test, because you are going to be required to know where it's increasing and decreasing anyway, so you might as well just stop there. But this is another option if you want to double check your work or, or go this way. So that's the second derivative test.
because they're awesome, there's actually nothing to do here. Pretty much all the information you would get in this section, we already did it. Right, so this chapter basically goes through and tells you, okay, the original function, you'd use it when you want to find coordinates on the graph. But if you want to find increase and decreasing, maximums or minimums, use the cursor. So it's that tail that I gave where I talked about the function, what it tells us. Uh, on the quiz? Yes, it was on okay. the quiz already. And how it tells us. Basically, all that information I summarized in that table is what this entire section is about. They take an entire section to tell you all that. So, all right, I told you, this is what the first area does, this is what the second area does, this is what the, all that stuff is. Dot, dot, dot. So, I, I don't really have to tell you anything. Which brings us to 4.4. favorite thing to do in this class, by the way. I just, I have a feeling. It's called curve sketching. Now, I gave handouts before. Yeah. Hopefully you guys brought them on curve sketching. This literally tells you everything you need to know about curve sketching. It summarizes everything you would have learned in these two sections. expand on stuff. So I will expand on step five here and then we'll go through all the steps and start just doing, doing some problems. That's one thing I didn't teach you yet, but every, I've taught you everything else you need to know. It's just the way you're going to put it together now. So in step five, we talk about something called the concavity test. So let's look at what that is. Basically, this is a test to figure out concavities. Basically, where a function is concave up or concave down. And inflection points. is basically the points where a function would switch concavities. The point where it actually switches from concave up to concave down, that's called an inflection point, or vice versa, from concave down to concave up. Right. So the thing with this test is it's very similar to the first order of test, except you're using the second order. And in this case, the signs mean something different. They actually mean, in, the, in this case, remember, positive would mean concave up, negative would mean concave down. But it's kind of like the first root of test. Thank you. 
happy to test. second derivative, you have to find the first derivative. That's by step two. Find its critical points, i.e., set the second derivative equals zero for undefined, and find those x values. based on this criteria. Concavity tests, our number line is being tested in the second derivative. Now, here's going to be some x value where at that point the second derivative is zero or undefined, but the original function f is continuous. Now, if you test on both sides of this guy, for example, if you're on the left, you test and you get a negative, that makes you concave down like a frown. Negative, you're down. So, you don't have a good time, you're negative. Okay, that means concave down. Right? If you test on this side and you get a positive, that means concave up. Apply the pump, you're feeling positive, you're happy, you're smiling. It's concave up. Now, because you switch from concave down to concave up, x is called an inflection point. A very similar thing can happen in the exact opposite way. So here you can be positive, which means you're concave up over here. Here you can be negative, which means you're concave down over here. And here, f is continuous, and f double prime equals zero or undefined. Then this guy is an inflection point. Those are the only two ways it can be an inflection point. You have to be switched from one concavity to the other, and that gives you an inflection point. Whereas the signs tell you about concave up or concave down in any other com combination. So an example of where a curve might look like this is it might look like that, right? Then that point is an inflection. Notice on the left side I'm concave down, shaped like a frown. On the right side I'm concave up, shaped like a cup. That point where the switch is made is called an inflection, right? It could also look like something like this, right? So I can have an inflection point while I'm increasing. I can also have an inflection point while I'm decreasing of this type, right? The second derivative has nothing to do with increasing or decreasing. For something like this, you could be like going like that, or concave up like that. So you could go like that, and that switches the inflection point. Or it could be going like that, and that switches the inflection point. Anytime you see the curve does that, that kind of wavy motion. That's called an inflection point, where the, where the switch is made.
I remember points like that are important. I, I gave that example when we were a store manager at that time, and we were talking about this number of sales we were making, and how a graph like this versus a graph like that can mean very different things, right? Where this means things are good, but they're slowing down. This means things are good, and they're actually getting better, right? It, it has a, there's an interpretation behind it, depending on what the function is measured. But that's the, that's the concavity test. That's basically what you're doing. It's kind of like a first derivative test, except you're using the second derivative. And your signs now tell you about concavity, not increasing and decreasing. Whenever they switch concavity, that gives you an inflection point. If you don't switch concavity, you don't have an inflection point. Or if the original function is not continuous there, you don't have an inflection point. So that's just expanding on um, step five. So now let's actually go through. I hope you all have this. I don't know if I have any extras. I have a few extras if anyone needs it. Does anyone need some extras? It's like I only have the students. Studious students left. <laughs> People are on top of it. OK, great. Awesome. Good. Moving on. So now we're going to look at curve sketching, right? So as I mentioned here, we've done most of the lead work. We're just going to put it, put it things together in a, in a very nice way, in a specific order, and it's somehow going to help us figure out how to actually draw something. Okay, so these are the steps to catch, sketch a given curve. You always go through these steps. It's kind of the same deal as related rates. And as you'll see later, op optimization. You always go through these steps in these orders. Um, if something doesn't apply, just skip over it and move to the next step. Right. So step one, observe what the domain is. It might come in handy. I think it'll, it'll kind of be obvious usually, but whatever. Just observe the domain. And you're mostly observing the domain for knowing when something like this doesn't work out, whether the function is continuously there or not. You'd want to know that. Although hopefully you should already see that. Okay, so step two, nothing really new here. We've been doing this in, since algebra and pre-calc. Find the x and y intercepts if possible, right? It's possible that I can give you a function where it's gonna be difficult to find them, but you're always going to try to find them. Um, the y intercept is usually pretty easy to find, but the x intercepts might give you trouble and it's okay to approximate them. Um, so, I even reminded you here how to do it. So um, we find the x-intercept by setting y equals 0 and then solving for x. And we find the y-intercept by setting x equals 0 and solving for y. So step one, figure out the domain so you know if one of these points don't exist, you have to avoid it. Step two, find your intercepts. Step three is to find asymptotes. Now asymptotes, is those are the guys like lines that you approach but you never touch, so like 1 over x squared. Right? x equals 0 is called an asymptote. In fact, it's called a vertical asymptote. Right? And y equals 0, see the function is sort of like <coughs> that, it's called a horizontal asymptote. Right? So we need to find guys like this and guys like that. Guys that our functions are going towards. Right? And how we find those is we actually use infinite limits, which not by now we're all experts on. Right? So step three is to find asymptotes if they exist, and there are two kinds. There's a horizontal asymptote. So to find the horizontal, you're going to take these two limits. Take the limit as x approaches infinity of the function, then take the limit as x approaches negative infinity of the function. And if you get an answer, a number, then that number is equal to your horizontal asymptote. If you don't get a number or the limit doesn't exist, you don't have a horizontal asymptote. Okay. For vertical asymptotes, you basically have to figure out where this limit shoots off to infinity, right? So it's like when your function is going off to infinity in the vertical manner. But pretty much, it's going to be where your denominator equals zero. That's the functions I'm going to give you where you need this would be rational functions. And you're just going to check where the denominator equals zero, and something like that is going to happen. There's going to be a vertical line that you cannot touch. 
Four, find the intervals of increasing and decreasing and the location of maximums and minimums. First derivative test, basically. That's step four. Step five is the concavity test, right? Find the intervals of concavity and the location of inflection points. You will use the concavity test in order to accomplish this. And step six, you're going to sketch the graph. You're going to put all that information that you have above there together, and you're going to actually draw the picture based on that information. And we're going to go through that, right? So one, figure out the domain. We know that. Two, figure out the x and y intercepts. We know that. Three, figure out the asymptotes. In theory, we know how to do that, but we'll have to get some practice to remind ourselves how to take limits. Um, step four, you do the first derivative test. Step five, you do the concavity test. Step six, you draw the picture. Okay. Um, I also mentioned here some rookie mistakes that you shouldn't make, that I see people make all the time. Um, so you guys can read through that. And So I just make comments on some mistakes that you should never make. But um, let's actually just jump through, jump into some examples here. So if you go on the second page, I have examples, more examples. So let's actually do this. And <laughs> conveniently, I have the graph of 1 over x squared here which happens to be the first example. I thought it would be nice to use an example that you guys are very familiar with to start out with, so we kind of um, don't get too scared starting off. Find all the important features I mentioned above, meaning I wanted to find intercepts, intervals of increase and decreasing, um, intervals of concavity, um, and <coughs> inflection points, locations of maximums and minimums, all of that kind of stuff. Um, so usually the way the problem is going to be phrased is how this is phrased. Right? So you see it, it will say here, consider the given function f of x. Um, Find all intercepts, asymptotes, relative extrema, intervals of increasing and decreasing, intervals of concavity, and inflection points of the function. Use that information to sketch the graph. That's how the question is going to be given to you. Right? So it's going to specifically state all the things we can find. In, there are cases where something like the x-intercept is kind of annoying to find. You'll notice that it's, the question actually won't ask you for the x-intercept. So pay attention to what you're reading and give me what I specifically ask for. Okay. So, it's going to tell you to ask for all of those, OK? So I need you to find all of those, if possible, and sketch the graph in, at the end of the day. We know that that's what the picture should look like, so hopefully we get that at the end of the day. Let's see how it works. So step one, domain. What's the domain of this function? Can equal zero? How do I write that down? Right. So from the beginning of the problem, I know now zero is a bad point. So I cannot plug in zero. I need to avoid zero. If anything is going on at zero, there's actually nothing going on at zero. Because zero doesn't exist. Okay. Step two. I will find the intercepts. So let's start with the x-intercepts. How do we find x-intercepts? Set y equals 0, solve for x. So this means 0 is equal to 1 over x squared. You will notice this has no solution. In other words, there's actually no x-intercept for this function. OK? What about y-intercept? y-intercept. For y-intercept, you set x equals 0 and solve for y. But it's not in the domain. 
So I actually can do that. So add no y intercept. So for this function, it has no x intercept, it has no y intercept. So even though it didn't have none, I had to check that step two. Just go through the process, check that if it has intercepts or not. Three. Now we're going to talk about finding asymptotes. Let's talk about horizontal asymptotes. For horizontal asymptotes, you're going to find two things. You're going to find the limit as x approaches infinity of the function and the limit as x approaches minus infinity of the function. So if I take the limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x squared, what is the answer? It is 0, right? Because the highest power is on the bottom. It's bottom heavy. Also, if I take the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 1 over x squared, what is the answer? Again, it's 0, bottom heavy, highest power is on the bottom. This means and 0 is actually a finite number. It's an answer. This means y equals 0 is a horizontal asymptote. That's how we find the horizontal asymptote. So I have no x-intercepts. I have no y-intercepts. However, I do have a horizontal asymptote. It's y equals 0. Let's talk about the vertical asymptotes. Basically, Set denominator equals zero. This means x squared equals zero. This means x equals zero. That is a vertical asymptote. You'll see me make a note in your um, in the in the steps here. Um, in general, you can cross horizontal asymptotes even though you don't have to, but you can never cross a vertical asymptote because you divide by zero. So those are our asymptotes. Now we move on to step four. Now in step four, we need to find increasing, decreasing, maximums, minimums. So let's actually do that. Make sure you have this all written down. So how do you find increasing, decreasing maximums and minimums? You use the first derivative, so you're going to actually use the first derivative test. So what we're going to do, we're going to find the critical points. Find y prime. In this, it's uh, 1 over x squared, so it's going to be minus 2 over x cubed equals 0 or undefined for critical points. And notice that x equals 0 is the only solution to that scenario. It's never 0, but it's undefined when x equals 0. So I'm going to go on a number line. I'm going to plug in 0. And I'm going to take random values. Put a 1 here, put a minus 1 here. Plug a minus 1 into the first derivative. I will get a, actually a positive number, which means I'm increasing. Plug in a 1 into that. I get a negative number, which means I'm decreasing. But Remember the domain. Zero is not in the domain, so this guy is nothing. Even though from this it might you might be tempted to say it's a max, it's actually nothing because that's not in the domain. So zero is just it's actually a vertical asymptote. Um, so notice that this is no, not max or min. So from this step, I can start to make some conclusions. I am increasing from negative infinity to 0, I am decreasing from 0 to infinity, and I have no max or min. These are the conclusions you want to get from step 4. Where are you increasing, decreasing? Where are you a maximum or a minimum? Step five. In step five, we care about concave up, concave down. 
concave down inflection points. Basically what we're going to do here is the concavity test. For the concavity test, I need the second derivative. So here the derivative was minus 2x to the minus 3. So if I find the derivative of that, I'm going to get 6x to the minus 4. That would be my second derivative. Um, second equal to 0 or undefined. And x equals 0 is going to be the only guy. And so now, on this number line, Notice here, I'm testing in the first derivative. Now I'm going to test in the second derivative. And again, I'm testing around 0. I'm going to random number here and here. This guy's a positive number divided by x to the fourth, which is always positive. I'm going to be positive everywhere. Now remember the interpretation of positive in this section. It does not mean increasing or decreasing. It means positive means concave up. So it means I'm shaped like a smiley face. Concave. This positive means concave up, so I'm still shaped like a smiley face, right? No inflection. So, it, and remember, not inflection. Not only because it doesn't switch concavity, but also because that point doesn't exist. It's not in the domain. So from this I can say, I am concave up on negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity concave down nowhere and no inflection. And that's step five. Now finally at step six we get to draw the picture. all the things that came from the, all the previous steps on this picture. So um, did we have any intercepts? No. So there's nothing to plot on the x or the y. Did we have asymptotes? Yes, we had a horizontal asymptote, y equals 0. We usually draw those on our graph as broken lines. So we know that that's something that the curve should be going towards. And we had a vertical asymptote, was x equals 0. increasing and decreasing. I was increasing from negative infinity to zero. So I like to weigh at the bottom of the graph, just put a little, draw in the whole interval. And I, I write here, I write increasing. Right, so I'm increasing on that side. And from zero to infinity, I was decreasing. Then I'm going to put my concavities in. From here backwards, I am concave up. And from here forwards, I am still concave up. Okay. So now here we're going to start drawing the graph now. And this is not really the one where you're going to have to really test any points, but I'll show you later where, where we test points. So now I know on this side of the graph, I know what I should be doing. I should be increasing and I should be concave up, right? I also know that I don't have intercepts, which means I know it's impossible for the graph to start down here. Why? Because if I increase, I'll cross that and make an intercept, which I know never happens, which means the graph has to be on top. If I'm not sure, plug in a value, right? Take x equals minus 1, plug into the original function, you get a positive number as the outcome, right? So I know I have to be up here, I have to be increasing, and I have to be concave up, which means I have to be doing that, like a smiley face. Now because this is a vertical asymptote, I cannot touch it, so I have to do that, right? Just start to approach it. Now if I want to figure out what am I doing as I go there, I took the limit as x went to negative infinity, and the answer was I approached zero. 
right? I know I never cross that because I don't have an intercept, so I am always above the x-axis. So I approach zero like that. Then I come over here. I know I'm decreasing concave up, which means I should be still be like a smiley face, but I should be falling, right? So I know I should be falling. I know I will never fall below this because that would create an intercept. So I go towards zero because I know that's a horizontal asymptote as I'm approaching infinity. Now, on the other hand, I still have to be decreasing the whole time until I approach that. Not very symmetric, but hopefully you get the idea. So here, I'm increasing concave up, so I know I'm increasing and I'm shaped like a smiley face. Right? I do not cross the x or the y axis because there are no intercepts. On this side, I'm decreasing, I'm falling, and I'm still concave up, so I'm falling and I'm shaped like a smiley face at the same time. I do not touch the y axis, I do not touch the x axis. As expected. a bit more interesting. No, we're not going to jump to H. Come on. We'll get there eventually. But something like B or C. Um, which one do you guys want to try? F is far away. B, C, or D? Okay, let's do B. So here f of x equals x to the fourth minus 4x squared. So I have to find all that blah, 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 sketch the graph at the end of the day. Okay, so step one, domain. everywhere. Cool. Two intercepts. So let's find the x intercept. Remember how we do that? You set y equals zero, solve for x. So that means zero is equal to x to the four minus four x squared. I factor out x squared. I can factor further. x equals 0, x equals 2, or x equals minus 2. Those are my x-intercepts. Right? Make sure you point that out, because you're, you're specifically asked for it, you have to point it out. Here are my x-intercepts. Now you're going to look for y-intercepts. Now how do you find the y-intercepts? You said x equals 0, so your y would be? Zero. 0 to the 4th minus 4 times 0 squared, which is just 0. So y equals 0, 0 y intercept. Cool, those are intercepts. 3, asymptotes. Can kind of cheat here. It's a polynomial. It is a general fact of polynomial that there are no asymptotes. Polynomials don't have asymptotes. So we will move on to step four. Step four, we have to find increasing, decreasing, maximums, minimums. So I'm going to find the first derivative and do the first derivative test. First derivative is going to give me 4x cubed minus 8x. Minus 
set that equal to zero or undefined. It's a polynomial, so that's not going to happen. So at this point, I can factor out 4x. I will be left with x squared minus 2. So here I get x equals 0, x equals radical 2, x equals minus radical 2. I will test these on a number line in the first derivative. Put in random numbers over here. For example, I can put in minus 2, minus 1, positive 1, positive 2. All right, because radical 2 is roughly 1.4. So why didn't you factor x plus I did. This, fact, this factors into x minus radical 2 times x plus radical 2. It's difference of scores. That's all it is. Or you can set that equal to 0, bring the 2 over, and take the square root of both sides, take the plus or minus. That's it's all up to you at this point. Plug in numbers. Now I'm going to test the intervals. Right? So I will plug in a minus 2 into the derivative. Plug in a minus 2 here, that's a negative. Plug in a minus 2 here, that's a positive, right? Because that's going to be 4 minus 2. So I have a negative times a positive, and this gives me negative. So I'm decreasing here. Plug in a minus 1, that's a negative. Plug in a minus 1, that's also a negative. I have a negative times a negative, that makes it positive, so I'm increasing. Plug in a 1, that's a positive. This is a negative. Negative times positive is negative, I'm decreasing. Plug in a 2, that's a positive. That's also a positive. Overall, I'm a positive, I'm increasing. Right? Now remember, this is a polynomial. The domain is everything. So all these points exist on the graph. So this guy is? Has to be a minimum. This guy has to be a maximum. This guy has to be another minimum. So. Now I can make conclusions from step four. Now according to what we did in step four, I am increasing, decreasing, where is my max, where are my mins? I am increasing negative radical two to zero and radical two to infinity. Decreasing and infinity to minus radical 2 and 0 to radical 2. My maximum occurs at 0, comma, 0. Right? My function was that was the function, right? Yes. So I plug in 0 and 0 here, I get 0 as the result. My minimums occur at minus radical 2, comma. If I plug in a minus radical 2 here, minus radical 2 to the fourth will give me 4. Radical 2 squared gives me 2 times this, that's 8. So I get a minus 4. Positive radical 2 will give me the same answer because all the powers are even. The signs actually don't matter, so this is also a minus 4. So remember, to find coordinates, I plug into the original function. That's how I'm getting these y values. That's my maximums, those are my minimums. Now I'm going to move on to step five. Concave up, concave down, inflections is what I do in step five, which means I'm going to find the second derivative. So I'm going to get 12x squared minus 8. Set that equal to zero or undefined. It is a polynomial, it's never undefined. So zero is going to be where I'm going to find the critical points. So I can solve this, I can factor out a four. So we need three x squared minus two. So I get my x would be um, what? Two or three radical plus or minus. Plus I have the second derivative. Minus radical two thirds, positive radical two thirds. I'm going to plug in zero in between them. 
to plug in here, this is definitely less than one, because it's two thirds, which is already less than one, and then I take a radical of it, it gets smaller. So I can plug in a minus one here, I can plug in a one here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to t plug this into here. The four I can ignore, it's always positive. So then one squared is one, three minus two, that is a positive number, which means concave up. So it's up like a cup. If I plug in a zero, I get negative two. So it's negative here, concave down, down like a frown. Plug in a one in here, I get a negative, I get a, also a negative, right? So that's concave down. Which means, do I have any inflections? How would you do the middle? Isn't it a positive? Where? Three. But that's why you minus two times four. Four. Um, for which one? For the number one. For one. For this positive one. one. No, no, positive one. one. Okay. Positive one. I have three. My oh yes, it, yes. it is positive. Sure. It's 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 it should give the same answer. This. One. Let's see if you guys are paying attention. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, so now, conclusions. This is definitely an inflection, because I switch from up to down. This is also an inflection, because I switch from down to up. So now I'm going to take my conclusions from step, step five. So where am I concave up? Where am I concave down? Where are my inflections? I need to go to the original function. If I plug in radical two thirds into this, I would get four over nine. Plug in radical two thirds into this, I get four times two thirds. That's eight over three. So that's four over nine minus, multiply by three over three. So I get 24 over nine. So I get what? Minus 20 over nine. Brings us to step six. Is y always going to be the same for the inflection point? No. no. Depends on the, the thing. Which we'll do a bunch, of, uh, lots more examples in the next class, and you'll see the kinds of variations that can happen. So now let's grab this. We're going to put in all the features that we had from the previous one. So, intercepts. What were the intercepts? X intercepts. Wow. Zero. Two and negative two. Two. Negative. And negative two. So I plot those points. A y intercept was just zero. That's already plotted. What else do I know? So that goes from the domain, I check plugged in the intercepts, there were no asymptotes. So tell me now about increasing, decreasing, maximums, and minimums. Where am I increasing? You're increasing from negative radical 2 to 0. So here I'm going to have negative radical 2. I'm increasing here. So I'm going to put a little sign down here, say so increasing. Where else am I increasing? So I put my radical 2 here, and I know from there, to infinity, I'm increasing. Where am I decreasing? Everywhere else, right? Yeah. So between here and here, I'm decreasing. And from here to there, I am decreasing. Where does my maximum and minimums occur? Zero, zero is your maximum. Zero, zero is a maximum, so I'm going to label that. And your minimum is 
Negative four. So down here I'm going to have a negative four. That is going to be my minimum. That's going to be my minimum. So that's all the information I get from step four. Move on to the step five. Where's my concavity? Uh, concave of negative infinity to negative um, radical two over three. So radical two over three is going to be somewhere over here. So I know from that point back, I'm concave what? Concave up. Concave up. And somewhere else? Um, yeah, radical 2 over 3 to So from there onwards, I'm concave up, which means in between I'm concave down, right? Where are my inflections? My inflections happened here, right? What was it like? Right. So that happened at minus 20 over 9. That's all our information. We're up to step 5 now. So now we're actually going to draw the picture. So now what's going to happen is, notice in this region, I am decreasing concave up, and I have to pass through this point and that point. That's that part of the graph, right? I'm shaped like a smiley face, and I'm decreasing. In this region, I am increasing and concave up, right? So between here, I'm increasing, and I'm still in the concave up region, so I'm going to be like that. That's your inflection point? This is the inflection. Right? So here I'm increasing, and I'm still in the concave up region. Now when I go here, I switch the concave down, and I'm still in the increasing region. You see that? I'm both increasing and concave down. So now I switch from a smiley face to a frowny face, but I'm still increasing. Oh, this is like that bounce thing. Right? Now, in this region, I am decreasing concave down. So I'm decreasing and I'm shaped like a frowny face. In this region, I keep decreasing, but now I switch the concave up. So I decrease like a smiling face. This is an inflection. And that's an inflection. Over here, now what's going on? For the rest of the time, I'm increasing and concave up. So I'm moving up like a smiling face. That's my graph. And it's not a W. It's a W with a lot of precision. I know when I should be curved in what way. right? I can pinpoint exactly where my inflections are, exactly where my maximum and minimums are. And that's how you would draw that particular function. Okay. We'll do a lot more examples. As you can see, the process is kind of... Next time.